It's good to be back with you after two months away on sabbatical. Thank you for the gift of that time away. Uh, it was a wonderful time for my family and, uh, and for me. Uh, we spent one month, all five of us, together in Crested Butte, Colorado. And then Cameron and I dropped off the kids with grandparents and hopped on a plane to Europe. And we made our way to a small village in southern France called saint jean pierre de port My French teacher is shaking her head, nodding. Um, my, my Spanish is slightly better than my French. But uh, saint jean is the common starting place of the Camino del Santiago. The Camino is this ancient Christian pilgrimage uh, that Christians have been walking for over a thousand years. Uh, the path goes, uh, the most common path goes from St. Jean in southern France across the Pyrenees mountains through the bowls of Pamplona and on across uh, northern Spain to the town uh, of Compostela on the western coast of Spain. And there is the shrine to St. James, St. Iago, uh, located at the Santiago, uh, the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela. And it's a 500 mile trek across France and Spain. Now, we didn't do that whole 500 miles, thank goodness. It usually takes people about five to six weeks to do the entire walk. And the Camino has been, has been featured in movies, like uh, Martin Sheen did a movie a few years ago called The Way. Some of you may have seen that. Um, and, and you avid readers, uh, Ernest Hemingway's novel, The Sun Also Rises, uh, the Camino is kind of the background uh, of the entire novel. Each year, thousands of people make this trek, make this pilgrimage, and they come from all over the world. Our first night uh, on the walk, we stayed in a hostel in St. Jean, and we were staying with a man from Tokyo, I mean, excuse me, a man from Hong Kong, and a man from London. And the next night, we stayed in a hostel housed in this giant, ancient monastery. And we stayed there and bunked with over 350 of our closest pilgrim friends. And then we walked another day, we did three days, and then we uh, took a train to Barcelona to rest and recover, <laughs> uh, like you do. But my favorite part of this trip was just getting to experience the pilgrim culture. There's an unspoken covenant of the people on the way. There's an unspoken, unarticulated way of life for the pilgrims, a camino of life for those that are living out this pilgrim journey. I mean, here are people from all over the world walking together. And at times, you're sure, you're walking alone. At other times, you're walking in groups, strangers becoming colleagues and friends. And there's this real sense all along the way that we're all in this together. Along the way, pilgrims always greet each other with the greeting, Buen Camino, good way to you. Buen Camino, it's like the official salutation. And, and Buen Camino, Camino immediately sort of initiates community. And I couldn't help but think of that simple phrase as I started reading the Libro de Santiago, the book of James of the New Testament. The book of James wants to articulate a Buen Camino for the community of Christ. Throughout this small book, he seems to be talking about a, a general posture of compassion within community. A posture of compassion which must start 
by expecting the best of each other and interpreting each other's actions and words through the lens of best intentions. We must be generous interpreters of the words and actions of others, or else we'll simply move through life bouncing from one outrage to the next, always looking for the next opportunity to be offended. Now, on the second day of the trip, we met this pilgrim, fellow pilgrim, uh, who was from England. Uh, and he and, uh, and Cameron and I walked together a little bit. We saw each other throughout the day, you know, buen camino, see you later. And, uh, and finally, we struck up a conversation with them a little bit. And, and we, told, we told him, you know, we're uh, just doing three days of, of the Camino, and then we're, you know, going down to Barcelona. And he kind of smirked and replied, ah, typical Americans, right? I mean, you just parachute in and then get out as quick as you can. And I said, well, you know, at least we stayed around long enough in World War II for you not to be speaking German now. <laughs> just kidding, I didn't say that. <laughs> I, I tried to be nice and just look for a way to quickly Brexit the conversation. <laughs> but I'm sorry, we, we, you know, we've got three kids. We can't just leave them with our English nanny and take off for a month. I mean, who am I, the Queen of England? I mean, it's... Of course, this guy was just joking, right? He was just joking around. And yet I still was a little offended. And I was a little mad. Because I chose to be mad. I could have easily just brushed it off and said, he's just joking around. Isn't it interesting how quickly we can become offended? How quickly we can choose to be offended? I mean, we live in this culture with, with the 24-hour news cycle uh, where, where that cycle is just built upon a foundation of outrage. Moving from one outrage to the next, each story specifically crafted to evoke a response from us. And we take our outrage then to the comment section of our favorite website or onto Facebook or Twitter, and we just pass on that cycle of anger round and round until it's our turn once again to sort of put on that mantle of wrath over and over again. James has a word for us. This book is for us. And we'll be reading passages from James uh, for the next several weeks. And I hope you'll take the opportunity this week to just go ahead and read through the whole book. Or if you don't want to read it, you can get on BibleGateway.com and you can listen to the entire thing read to you in under 15 minutes. And it's very theatrical. It's read by an, art, by an actor and there's music in the background that sort of builds and swells. It's beautiful. But I hope that we can get to know this book this month. Now the book of James of the New Testament is not the same James of the Santiago, uh, of the Camino del Santiago. Santiago uh, is James the Greater. <clears throat> and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the book of the New Testament is James the Lesser, or James the Just, or James the Brother of Jesus, or there's a lot of arguments about who exactly all those people are and if they're one, two, or three different people. So we don't need to worry about that. It's just James. Meet James. And aren't you glad that you won't go down in history as James the Lesser? That's just not fair. The book of James has a lot to say to pilgrims or anyone on a journey has a lot to say to communities of faith 
trying to live together, trying to figure out how to be the body of Christ. Martin Luther didn't like the book of James, and he called it an epistle of straw. And he didn't like it because it, it doesn't really mention Jesus much, uh, and, and he doesn't like that James seems to sort of refute Paul's uh, message James says, be doers of the word. James says, faith without works is dead. Paul says, we are justified by faith. We aren't saved by works, but by grace. Paul says, it's, it is believing that saves. And James challenges us. And in doing so, brings this whole other dimension to our understanding of the gospel. And of course, Luther argued that this book just needs to be thrown out of the Bible. And while it's never been officially removed from the canon, it has been marginalized. We've deemed James a works righteousness gospel. And we may not have removed it from the Bible, but we certainly ignored it. And yet as much as we try to focus on believing, on receiving Jesus into our hearts, on working on our personal faith, as much as we try to focus on these things that we've, that we've pulled and, and culled out of, of Paul's message, still James stands on the margins and speaks to us. Speaks to us saying, your faith is not your own. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God is this, to care for the orphans and widows and to keep oneself unpolluted by the Romans. I know it says world, but he means Roman world. You see, your faith will increase in relation to the growth of compassion you have for those on the margins. Your faith will grow the more you give of yourself to the body of Christ. He says every generous act of giving, every good gift comes from God. Everything good comes down from the author and, and father of the heavenly lights. When we give, we do what God does. When we give of ourselves, of, we give of what God has given us. And here in just a few verses, James is expressing what so many have tried to articulate over the course of, of thousands of years, really. He, he's talking and defining, uh, defining God. You know, God, the God who, who really is God. The God behind and beyond all the, the lesser gods of our own making. The one who created all that is. The one who is beyond anything that we can ever comprehend. That whose character has no change, no shadow of variance. The ultimate reality. But God is also the very ground of being. In all our seeking, all our thinking, all our feeling, all our living, we do through God, in relation to God. St. Augustine said it like this. He said, God is not only beyond my utmost heights, but also more inward to me than my inmost parts. There's no partaking in reality that is aside or away from God. And now that James has defined this God that we're discussing, this God who is the God of Jesus Christ, 
He turns to try to answer that question that all of us preachers fear most. So what? If James were here today, I wonder if he might answer that question like this. We all share the same origin. We are all of God. And like those pilgrims on the Camino, we find out sooner or later that we all share a common journey. Since we're all in this together, and since we all share so much of the bounty of what God has given us, we need to give ourselves a break. We need to let go of the anger that poisons your mind and prohibits the growth of the implanted word within you. Be doers of the word because in doing, faith takes hold in your life. And if you're looking for God, look to the margins, to the forgotten children and women. Because we have a word for them. That word implanted within us is a word for them. But more importantly, they have a word for us that will shape us into the community of Christ that God is calling us to be. We are all of the same origin. And being doers of the word means being ready to see God in action all around us. And yet we can't see through angry eyes. We would be better, we would live better, live healthier if we would be generous interpreters of the word, of the words and actions of others. Now, Jason Fried is uh, the founder and CEO uh, of Basecamp, which is a uh, project management software uh, that's very common and, and used a lot. And he tells this story, Jason does, about attending a conference. And he goes and he hears this lecturer. Uh, and immediately the lecture starts and he didn't like it. He didn't agree with anything uh, that the, the speaker was saying. And as the talk went on and on, uh, Jason just became more and more agitated uh, and, and disagreed so much that after the talk was finally over, he ran up to the speaker and just told him everything that he had said wrong and, and expressed all of his disagreements with him. Uh, and the speaker listened. And then he said, give it five minutes. And Jason was taken aback, and he, but then he realized the point. After the first few moments of the lecture, Jason officially, effectively stopped listening. He heard something he didn't agree with, and he just immediately entered refutation mode. And in refutation mode, you just want to refute whatever you're hearing. So there's no listening. And when there's no listening, there's no thinking. To enter refutation mode is to say that you've already done all the thinking you need to do, that no further information or reflection is required. See, refutation mode prohibits growth and transformation. It's a poison to beloved community. Being generous interpreters of the word and generous interpreters of each other opens up new possibilities for movement of the Spirit of God. Now, yes, it's dangerous. 
It comes at a cost. We might be changed. We might be saved. But maybe you're thinking, I don't need that. I was saved when I was six. I believe I'm done. Some people just need to be written off and ignored. Maybe you're upset right now thinking this whole sermon is a bunch of baloney. Maybe you're sitting there thinking there's so much in the world to be angry about. The injustice, the the hungry, uh, the rich getting richer, all these people protesting. If you're angry or offended, give it five minutes.